What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. It's episode 746 of The O Show. Remember to comment, like, and subscribe on our YouTube channel at Jack O'Hara TV. We are with the one and only Mr. Brian Breach today, uh, live via satellite out of uh, Miami, Florida. Are you originally from Miami? Reason Starling. Oh, uh, no. So not originally uh, from, from Florida. I was born in New York, actually. And okay. uh, seven, eight-ish crazy stuff went down. We ended up coming down here. And I'm officially a Floridian. A lot of people are like, oh, I still hear the New York accent. I'm like, I don't think you do. I think that may be your imagination. I'm, I'm South Florida for life, baby. Miami Heat all day. I mean, look at the shirt. I mean, it's like that's a Floridian shirt right there. This is this is South Floridian right here. I don't know if it's a cow pattern. I don't know what it is, but definitely, definitely have some South Floridian vibes there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're an entrepreneur. You've started a lot of stuff. You could see you on NBC, uh, Fox News, uh, Inside Edition. You're going to be the face of a magazine here coming up in the next 24 hours. You're already on the cover of multiple different magazines, it seems like. Uh, I am very curious as to, you know, how you got into this growing up, kind of like your childhood, what you went through growing up, kind of the trials, tribulations of that leading you to who you ended up becoming, man. 100%. Thank you for asking. Thanks for having me on. It was uh, a little tumultuous back then. It's interesting. So I grew up in New York. Um, um, How I worded on my TED talk, I was born to an extremely busy dad and a very abusive mom. Uh, My mom was a little bit, you know, my my mom was a little bit on the craziest side, on the abusive side. She was actually caught um, interstate trafficking drugs. Uh, They came to the house. She actually got um, taken in on a lesser charge. Um, There was a lot of stipulation of what happened, but I guess she was wise with her lawyers and very long story short, um, she actually cheated on my dad with somebody that was staying in the basement of a neighbor's house, the people that we grew up with. And when she did that, she actually contracted HIV when I was a kid, Um, unbeknownst to my dad. Thank God he's still alive because they were together for a little bit of time after that happened. Um, Somehow, some way with good lawyers, she ends up getting custody and taking us to Florida where my dad stayed in New York and he was struggling and All sorts of things were going down there. And then she met a man who turned out to be or became my quote unquote stepfather. They never actually got married, but he lived with us and they were together for years. Um, And right as my mom was getting sick and and she was in the hospital, you know, and and going through chemo and everything uh, from HIV. And she also had a brain tumor, which was cancerous. Um, He was killed in some sort of crazy drug deal gone wrong. Uh, I found out through a newspaper that my grandma handed me to read. And um, then my dad finally got custody. And then we moved to this place called Pembroke Pines. He was sleeping on the floor. And, um, we were struggling, you know, not a lot of money coming in. Then he met my stepmom and then all sorts of other crazy stuff went down. We met my stepmom within the first couple months. She has a grand mal seizure, almost dies. And my dad has, um, they give him a staph infection in the hospital from the back surgery he did within the first couple of years I was in the house. And he was out of commission. So needless to say, I was very independent at a young age. I figured out how to make money. From the minute I came out my mother's womb, I was signed, I was trying to sell uh, breast milk to the other babies in the ward, you know, trying to make money. And um, throughout school, I always found ways to make money. I think it was uh, I think it was my senior year. I was in a class with a, a teacher named Mr. Evans, and he opened my idea up more to opening a business and being an entrepreneur where I hadn't seen it before. Yes. Did I? sell candy, buy, buy M&Ms at 25 cents and flip it for 75 cents, of course. Was I playing pencil peg and betting? Was I flipping coins against walls and trying to make money? I always came home with money. It was it was like a thing of mine. But then in, in my senior year, I kind of saw the structure and what you could be as an entrepreneur. And that kind of changed my mindset. Although I worked nine to fives up until I was like 28-ish, I, still, um, I was still an entrepreneur to whole, heart all those years. You know. So what did what were some of those odd jobs that you were working those nine to fives? Oh man, uh, what did I do? So I started off at eleven years old, and uh, I was a bus boy and a cashier, and I was cleaning out the refrigerator at a pizzeria called Sarah's Pizza. At the age of twelve, was the only year that I wasn't able to get a job. And then when I moved to Hollywood, Florida, at thirteen, I went over to this place called Wild Rose. It was an Italian restaurant, and they put me in the back as a dishwasher. As a dishwasher. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know how I got jobs at 11 and 13. I mean, it was it was, it was interesting. But they gave me a job. I guess they were trying to pay me little amounts of money. And as I was washing the dishes, they wanted me to save the uneaten olives and tomatoes off people's plates. And I, I had some morals as a kid because I told them no. And then they fired me. So at the age of 14, I ended up working at Flores Italian restaurant and a Chinese restaurant simultaneously. And that was for two or three years. Then I got a job busing tables and then waiting tables at Bennigan's. Then the telemarketing world came. 
I got into telemarketing, moved up quick. I got very heavy in the sales. And then by the time I was 20, 21, I was basically managing a whole marketing agency, a telemarketing agency with other managers, of course. But I was doing all the hiring, the firing, the retrains, the first trains, uh, giving all the speeches. I was 21. I had like 50 employees underneath me. Um, and then and then I went back to the restaurant industry. Then my last nine to five ever for four years was at a college. I was an online admissions advisor. And when they fired me, I never went back to a nine to five again. I got in some legal troubles during that time. They wouldn't even hire me on the same campus in a different department. Um, and then I was done. I never worked a nine to five again. And I've been an entrepreneur ever since. Started my own company multiple times. And um, I will never go back to a nine to five again, ever. I mean, that's basically the story of any entrepreneur. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with a nine to five because it, you know, it teaches you how to be be on time. It teaches you ethics. You know, it teaches you all kinds of things. But now that I've been out that space for so long, it was an appreciative lesson, and I will never go back again because I love what I do now. Well, it sounds like you had experiences that most like kids wouldn't experience today. There's kids who are 28 years old now who are in like startup positions and just as like a sales rep or, you know, just starting out where you had a team under your belt, a team of what you said, 50 people when you were 21 years old. Like not yes. a lot of people are are experiencing that on any sort of level, whether it was like a high thing or, or some, something kind of under the radar. Right. Yeah. There was about 50 employees underneath me and it was crazy because there was a lot of people that were my age during that time. And what was funny about that particular time is that when I went in there, I started on the phones doing telemarketing and learning sales. And um, I used to go in there every day with a tie on and dress nice. And all the people in there would be like, fuck you doing, bro? Get the fuck out of here. You're looking stupid. Why are you dressing like that? We don't need to. And I'm like, you're going to see why I dress like this and give it about three months later everybody's underneath me and I'm doing all the trains and they, there were some people like the older people kind of hated me. And when I used to monitor the phones, um, I would hear people be like, Oh, this damn manager is always listening. They didn't like the fact that someone who's 20, 21 years old was managing someone who was 55, 60 years old that were on the phones doing telemarketing. But it was an amazing experience. Although a lot of the people in there were a little crazy. Um, and it was just a wild place to work. Um, it was a, it was one of the best experiences that I ever had. Well, at very least, you're getting the experiences of dealing with so many different characters and personalities. Like some people might be weird. Some people you might gel with. Some people you, you might just get along with on a professional level. Some people on a personal level. Like all of these experiences is teached you by the time you were 28, 29 years old, when you started up your own stuff, either in success or in failure, you knew how to deal with all sorts of different types of people. Oh, 100 percent. Even from a kid, I've been through so much adversity from not only my mom and, and you know, my stepdad that was passed away. I mean, it was so, so much of my family passed away when I was younger. I've been through so much at such an early age that I feel like I became like an old soul in a sense. And yeah, definitely working with so many different personalities. I mean, my bosses alone were nuts. I had one boss who would scream and yell and kick stuff and throw chairs against glass windows. And then I had another boss, Frank Palmer, who was the calmest, uh, uh, calmest, most um composed individual that I've ever met. It was such a weird dynamic. So um, in those situations, you definitely learn how to deal with all sorts of personalities. So what would you say was the most excited you were for one of your startup businesses or even like a project that didn't end up going the way you wanted to? And what did you learn most from it? What was the most excited that I've been? Hmm. I think it was during the music times, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, at a young age, uh, I say in high school, we started rapping in high school. That formed into a group called Real Life Dialect with my partners, uh, Lex One and Ist and Jesse Joint. He passed away since, uh, say, like six years back. But um, during that particular time, when we stopped uh, rapping as a group, Real Life Dialect, my boy Lex is like, yo, we need to form a label called Get That Paper Son or GTBS. I still have it on my wall here and you still see some of the logos behind me here. And I was so excited, man. I thought I was going to be like Diddy from Bad Boy. And we had so many artists underneath us. Um, that's where I learned how to grow social media for people. So we had like eight artists, I believe it was, underneath us. And I was growing their Twitter. I was growing their SoundCloud. I was growing their Instagram page. And that actually turned into a business. My partner was like, yo, why are we doing this for free? Why don't we make money off this? Everybody's growing their social media. And all of a sudden, it turned into a business. And I had three computers all looking like the Matrix. And I was growing Instagram pages for politicians and models and actresses and yoga companies and uh, streetwear companies and all sorts of businesses, uh, which then converted into Make Me Viral Media, which is my company now. So 
I'd say I was the most excited during that time because we were performing collectively as a group, almost like the Wu-Tang did. We were on stages all at once. We would all go record it at once. It was, it was like a really good time in my life. Yeah, because you're collaborating. Everybody's on the same wavelength of wanting to kick the door down, not just like knock on the door, but kick that motherfucker down. Yeah. And yeah. then you get to the point where business gets involved and money gets involved and then people become uptight about certain things, especially in the music industry. Like I, I, my brother's a musician, I've seen spurts of it through relationships that I've had in the past, but I've always been told that it's a very toxic industry if you let it become toxic. It's yeah, it's a little tricky of an industry for me. I don't know if I want to say toxic. It was a little uh, it was tricky in South Florida because, you know, we used to throw a lot of hip hop shows and we used to open up for all kinds of famous artists. It was, it was crazy. I've got to stand on stages with, you know, I've hosted shows and thrown shows with Nas and N.E.R.D. Pharrell and, uh, you know, the Wu-Tang guys and Big Boy from Outkast. I mean, we've done shows with all sorts of people and it's very hit or miss sometimes. So toxic. Yeah, there, there's some toxicity there, but um, you never know when a show is going to do well. My best show. It was the weirdest thing. My best show of all time is this, uh, the rapper named Cannabis. I don't know if you remember him, but he was big at a certain period of time in the hip hop industry. And I didn't know, you know, I, I didn't know if that was going to be the biggest show. All I know is that he hadn't performed for years and everyone was excited. To, everyone was excited to see him. I packed out that club to the point where there was like a hundred people waiting outside and the fire department had to come. And then I throw a show with even a bigger artist that doesn't do well. It was such, so hit or miss. So it was very frustrating. And then it was like 2017, I had released an album with Big Pun's son, Chris Rivers, and uh, uh, Mickey Fax, who was on the cover of the Double XL. I kind of hit my wall, and I'm like, damn, I'm just not getting to where I want to be. And I made a conscious decision to start shooting viral content. So I was already verified on Instagram. I already had a little following. It was like 50,000 followers at that time. I remember writing on a whiteboard saying, you have one year to go viral, or you're not going to be shooting skits and social experiments and pranks anymore. Midway through that year, I was given the opportunity to do a TED Talk. And then the end of that year, uh, one of my videos took off and went internationally viral. And between those two things, it just blew me in the stratosphere and changed the trajectory of everything. It got me on hundreds of podcasts, radio, TV opportunities, some magazine stuff. And uh, things are still rolling from that. I don't want to say from that video. It's because I personally am a good marketer and I kept the momentum up consistently. And I kept putting myself out there. And I kept the wheels turning, but that was the catalyst for everything that happened in the last three years. It was nuts. So what would you say? Because now you have Make Me Viral Media, right? You said right. That about halfway through that year, you said is when it kind of started popping off for you. What what kind of makes a viral video? Like, what are you looking for specifically? I know in today's world, controversy sells There's certain clips that are funny to some people. You know, the algorithm checks out sometimes like what what makes a viral video and what were some of those early videos that you were making that you thought would have been viral that didn't really hit the pan? <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a couple. Um, So what makes a viral video these days? I think the big thing viral obviously and mind you you know people like us who are entrepreneurs there's different types of virality there's virality for crazy stuff that happens an earthquake or you know someone tries to assass assassinate the president whatever a fight someone throws up in a pool um those are things you don't want to go viral for but intentionally trying to go viral it's usually humorous type of content and it's usually informative type of content um, there's a lot of things that you have to do to a video to consistently make it go viral. Again, if you, if, if me and you want to go viral today, we can literally go outside and we can, you know, pretend to run over somebody in the street. We'll go viral if we film it, of course, but that's, that's not we, what we want. We want to be very intentional with our videos. So virality comes from watch time, mainly on a video. So if you put out an informative video and it could be something, it, it could be you telling a story about a UFO sighting, something that you think will absolutely go viral. But if you don't get people's attention in that first three seconds of that video or no it's even longer than that it's about seven to 15 seconds that's like the window right there that you want people to watch that video because that tells instagram oh shit this video has potential people are watching it there's something about this video and then instagram will put you in a secondary algorithm and then keep moving you up in the algorithm get to get you outside of the follower so whatever video you shoot if you want it to potentially go viral you have to get the watch time high so I had pulled a prank in a Miami Heat game after I started going viral more and more in front of 20,000 people. I posted it one year later on TikTok and my highest and that's my highest viewed watch time. It was 30 seconds. That was the average watch time on the video. All my other videos that the average watch time was like two seconds, three seconds. Nothing happened with them. So in order to go viral these days, you need high watch times. You need to hook people in um, and that'll be beneficial. But there's all sorts of ways to go viral. So uh, the earlier stuff that I did. 
I remember the first video that I shot where I just transitioned out of music into viral skits. And it was the worst piece of shit that I ever shot in my life. Right. It was called the Cardi B mating call. And it's funny. I never thought in a million years that after I went viral, people would ask me to speak on stage about how to go viral because I did a TED talk and that wasn't the topic at all. So after I went viral, people were like, hey, do you want to speak at this glass house mansion in the Hamptons? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. They're like, what would you talk about? I'm like, well, my TED talk was this. They're like, no, what else? I'm like, I went viral recently. And I remember the conversation exactly. He was like, that's it. I want you to teach kids and people in the audience how to go viral. I'm like, okay, wait a second. That does make sense. I do have a story here to tell and I can tell people my story, my experience, how I made it happen. And um, so now I speak on stages about it and I talk about this Cardi B video. So the Cardi B video, horrible piece of shit. I, I, I flew this girl out from Texas. She was a comedian. And it's basically about two people falling in love to Cardi B noises. So we meet each other in a plaza and she walks up to me. She's like, oh, and I'm like, eh. and she's like, and it's horrible. Even talking about it, I'm like cringing, speaking about it, right? Um, so, but I learned so much about that video. Like, again, it, it was, it, it ended up getting, I forget, I always forget the exact number. I have it on the slide in my PowerPoint, but it, I think it was like 173,000 views. And when it hit that number, all I thought to myself was if I can make a video of this low caliber to hit 173,000 views, imagine when I put dramatic amounts of effort into actually trying to go viral. Right. But I learned a lot of things. I learned uh, the lettering on the video during that time it, um, when people were shooting skits, they were putting the big letters um, to, to kind of let people know what the skit was about so that it would immediately catch, catch their attention. So the top of the video said the Cardi B, the bottom of the video said the matey call. So I was experimenting with lettering and text across video during that time. Um, the one thing I learned about that video too, when the main thing is that you can use negativity to boost you up in the algorithms because the video was so bad. And at the end of the video, me and her were like twerking. Now, Yes, I, I'm white, right? And I come from a, a Jewish family, although I have my own beliefs. But she was Hispanic, if I'm not mistaken. So everybody was talking shit like, look at these two white people twerking in the video. Idiots. What are they doing? They don't know how to dance. And I was like, first of all, she's Hispanic. Second of all, you know, I start feeling like, damn, I don't know if I could take all this criticism. And then you start learning that you need to have thick skin if you want to go viral. Because no matter what, I don't care if you're God. God's Instagram page will get negative comments. This is how that's just how the world is. Right. So I, I embraced it. Right now. Not as not as much as like an example that I use is like Takashi six, nine. Right. What does Takashi six, nine do? He trolls the Internet. He doesn't care about the negative comments because this is what happens when he gets too many negative comments. The positive comments for him always come to the rescue. So you'll have like 60 percent of people being like snitch rat rat you're annoying snitch and then you'll have all these people who cares if he snitch they were screwing his baby mama who cares if he snitch what, what is he going to spend his life in jail to protect these idiots and all these positive come to the rescue and what happens is underneath the post somebody says a negative comment and then there's like 100 arguments under one thread then the next one 50 arguments under one thread and and what would have been 400 comments jack turns into like 14,000 comments so it's OK to embrace the negative comments on a video because it helps it to go viral as long as you're not being racist. And as long as you're not doing something dramatically bad to human beings, embrace the negative. Right. You know, I may you may post this video and someone's like, I hate that dude's shirt. I'm not harming anyone. Whatever. Talk about the damn shirt. Talk about the, the cow patterns. I don't care. It's going to help us in the algorithms and it'll boost us up. So I learned so many things. And then I shot a social experiment where I went into the biggest mall in Florida. And I pretended to be a celebrity and I hired fake bodyguards, fake paparazzi. Uh, and I hired all these actors and I planted them in the crowd. And within like 20 seconds, I had two girls come up to me. Oh, my God, it's Brian Breach. Within two minutes, I had 200 people lined up asking for my autograph. And I learned so much about that. I posted that. It went semi-viral. It went on a bunch of viral sites. And then I got into a rhythm. And then the real one hit and then another one hit and then another one hit. And I started figuring out, uh, I started to figure out my own algorithm on what worked for me. You have to experiment with content, you know? Mm, I mean, that's very interesting because you're right. Like negativity runs supreme. Like we could post something Ooh. and someone's like, what a stupid shirt that Brian is wearing. And a nice, <laughs> nice pink jacket, Jack, you know, right. like that's just negativity, like whatever, like positive or negative, like, I think I, I'm a believer that all publicity is good publicity, except for the, you know, like you, you're being racist or just being politically incorrect. 
right. even that sometimes is like whatever, like because everybody has their own perspective on things. But it's very right. important to re like remember, like no, like all of this is good publicity for me. As long as I'm being true to myself and being authentic to myself, there's gonna half of these people are gonna be haters anyway. Just just for you posting a video in general, people are gonna hate on it for whatever reason. Yeah, it is what it is. And you know what it is when you post stuff. If the negative people continue to follow you, that's amazing. I mean, let let them follow you. Um, if anything, you're going to lose the following you don't want and the right following is going to come your way. Look at someone like uh, Howard Stern, right? Yeah. There was this thing back in the day that I don't quote me on this because I'm just paraphrasing, but it was something like the longest listeners of his. They tune in for like two hours are the ones that hate his ass. The, the Imagine that. Just think of that concept. The people that hate Howard Stern. Tune in longer than the people that like Howard Stern. I mean, that's mind blowing, but that it, it is what it is. This is the internet. You it's know? so backwards it, too, because it's like you hate so, him, but like, why are you? Then why are you listening to him? It makes no sense. You know, you you just got to learn to embrace it. And I don't get me wrong. There are moments where I'll see a comment. I'm like, ooh, that one kind of hit me right here. You know, but you just got to you just got to move on. It is what it is. You're gonna notice way more positive than you are negative. And uh, once you once you're doing well and numbers are going up and you bring value to people, you know, and you meet people out in person, they love you. You know, like no one's going to be like, oh, you got eight negative comments on that video. No, they a lot of people want something from you. So when they see you're doing well on social media, they're going to treat you right. They're going to give you opportunities. They're going to be positive to you. So it's OK when you have those little negative comments here and there. You just got to embrace it. It is yeah. what it is. And when I'm dead. You think I'm going to care about that eight comments somebody left on the Cardi B video? I don't give a shit. No. And, and you got to remember that, like, and I'm a big believer in this, and you probably believe this, too, as meaning as many people as you have in your life. You can't really hate on someone that you've never met in person. You know, like, you can't right. really just see someone on TV or see someone on social media and see their TikToks and their reels and all this BS and think, I don't like this person. Because for right. the most part, they're playing a character especially on social media, right? As a musician on stage, you have to play the part of a front man or a DJ or whatever it is you're doing. Like you're playing a character. You're, you're not, right. You, you, I think you're at your most successful when that character bleeds into who you actually are. And I think that's who, I mean, you see that resonate with some of the most, some of the biggest names today out there. But I also right. believe that until you meet someone for the first time, even a first impression might not go well. I, I've interviewed people where I could tell they were just in a bad mood that day. It wasn't me. <laughs> but like I, I got a bad experience and I got to remember right. like, OK, everybody's human, especially people doing junket interviews and doing interview after interview after interview. They're not going to be on all the time. And you have to have that expectation. I've gone into interviews sometimes thinking like, I can't believe they agreed to do that interview with me because on social media, they come off as a total arrogant jackass. And then you meet them in person and they're awesome. I'm like, oh, this person is not at all who they portray themselves on social media. And that's why they're so successful. They're genuinely down to earth. Great people. 100%. And, you know, somebody that comes to mind that I'm thinking about was a great example is um, if you're familiar with Little Dicky, I don't know if you watch the show, Dave. I love that damn show. Well, on one of the episodes, and again, this is fictional, but this is how he really is in real life. On one of the episodes, I think he tweeted something to the effect of like, just got head from my girlfriend. <laughs> and yeah. she was all pissed about it. She was like super pissed. And he's like, what? That's just Little Dicky. I'm just, this is a character. I'm not, you know, so I totally get your point. It's, it's, it's interesting. Oh yeah. And he gets a lot of, he's one of those guys that is, you either love him or you hate him. Based on, based on his humor, right? He's a, a little over the top sometimes with his whole nakedness, but like the guy's a genius, in my opinion. I, I, I think he has genius level thoughts and the way he puts together that show and writes for the show, it's 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 brilliant. I, th I think comedians specifically, the ones that are willing to test that barrier and say things that they know are jokes, but they know like half the audience is going to be turned off by this. The, the right. comedians that are willing to take that risk and are confident enough to pull that stuff off, I think are the best. Like Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians of all time, <laughs> just because he doesn't care. Like he genuinely believes in his beliefs. It's it's like not even comedy. He's just stating what he believes, but he's saying it in just an angry way because he's pissed off that the rest of the world is so soft in certain ways that it, it comes off as if, as if he's just mean and he's being derogatory towards people. But he genuinely feels that way and that's who he is on stage and that's why he's so successful and resonates with such a big part of the audience. Right. Oh, Bill Burr's absolutely has. I don't you think I care if you're fat? Then shut up. You know, yeah, he's just, yeah, Bill Burr's great. I like watching Did you do impressions? No, absolutely not. That, that one was pretty know. good. 
Thank you. I have no idea where that just came from. I do not do impressions. I, I do accents from time to time. It just pops out of me. Like I, I, I tell girls that I may be seeing, you know, or, or someone I'm dating, like, hey, if I do random access just out of nowhere, I apologize. Just go with the flow. This is what I do. You know? No, that, that was really good. And I'm sure <laughs> being from New York, being an East Coast boy, you've been in Florida for a while now, but I've never, I'm going to Miami in October. What is the vibe over there? Cause I always hear mixed things because it, it depends on the person. Some people are like, Oh dude, the nightlife is awesome. Where like other people who aren't into that are just like, never go to Miami. Like, like what's the vibe over there? So I have different perceptions on it and it, it really depends. Right. So, Oh man, how do I explain this? When I was younger, I, I was in the club scene a lot, but I never got sucked into it. So I call it the Miami vacuum, right? You could come down in Miami and you move to Miami and you completely get annihilated. And, and I know this has happened for a fact. I know girls who are Midwest, good girls, slept with like one dude their entire life, literally come down here, get caught up in the nightlife, get passed around by, by the, uh, the promoters, get put in a group chat talking about who they slept with. I mean, crazy. This is true, true stories, by the way. Um, if you move to Miami, you just have to be very smart not to get sucked up in it. Because here's the issue. One of the main things to do down here is the nightlife and is to go out and to go to the clubs and go here and go live, whatever. And, um, the issue is that let's say you're a girl, for example, right. And a girl comes down here and all their friends happen to do that. You're not going to be the one girl that stays home on a Friday night and sit your ass home when everybody is doing that. Right. But the issue is that everybody does it. So if you're somebody that comes down here and you're not heavy in the club scene, you need to go out your way and strategically put that out there to people and your friends or new friends you're going to meet and be like, listen, I'm not too in the club scene. I'd rather go kayaking, jet skiing. I'd rather go to all these amazing museums that they got going on down here. I'd rather travel through the state of Florida, go to caverns, caves and all this stuff. And there are people out there like that. So if you're going to come down here and you're not into the club scene, there's so many amazing things to do down here. But you got to put it out there because if you get linked up with the wrong crew that all they do is party. Trust me, you're not going to be the one staying home. You're going to go with them. Then you're going to get sucked up in the South Florida vacuum. Now, when I was younger, again, I did go clubbing and I was out constantly. And it was it was like the thing to do. But if I can go back in time now and I can pull, pull back all the time that I wasted in clubs, drinking, chasing girls, doing all that stuff, I'd probably get two years of my life back to go then put it into something productive. You know, it, it's crazy. So, yes, Miami is amazing. South Florida is amazing. There's so many sites. There's so many things to do. Just um, don't get caught too much up in the nightlife. It's it, it, it's amazing. You know, it's fun. You're going to meet some girls. You're going to meet some people. You're going to network a little bit. But there's so many networking events. There's Tonight, there's epic talks going on at the SLS. It's, it's way better than a club. You meet amazing people, millionaires, people with startups, people in the tech industry. They go out to a nice lounge. They smoke a nice hookah. You get to conversate. You get to talk. And it's way more beneficial than getting sucked up and spending uh, 20 hours of club space. Now, for the people that do it, I'm not hating on it. I used to do it. Um, but I just know that if I could relive it, and I don't regret anything, but if I could relive it, I would do something different to better my future instead of wasting that kind of time. That's crazy. You say, like, if you could go back, it would be almost like equal to two years worth of your time if you could relive all those times. I may be exaggerating, but yeah, I I get a lot of time back wasting all my Friday, Saturdays and uh, night going to the Hard Rock and, and just hanging out. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, the Miami vacuum, that's a good one. I think it's the Scottsdale vortex out here in Arizona. We're <laughs> like, we've had friends, specifically female friends who don't even look the same that they did like three years ago. Like I went to college with a few where it's like, you, you didn't age. even, not even, it's just like complete, like Botoxed out and just, right. they, they don't look like the same person. They look great. They look beautiful, but like, they don't like, you know, that's not natural. And I'm like, what happened? It's like night and day. And then right. you just get, you're, you become Scottsdale, you become Miami, you become right. Vegas, New York, wh wherever, Austin now, Nashville. Th those I feel like are just, they have their their bars and their streets. They have Broadway and downtown. Where like Miami, Scottsdale, New York, like you can get sucked into those atmospheres. And I've heard, I've heard really great things about Miami and I have heard horror stories about Miami. So I'm Ooh. very curious as to what it's going to be like when I go in October. Yeah. And it's a big, you know, it's a big hookup culture. Like, uh, you know, I'm not saying I've been on search for the right girl for a long time, but I haven't been in an, a serious relationship in about five years now. But I've dated hundreds of times. I mean, it's crazy. I just it, it's we live in a crazy culture and maybe I'm a part of the culture because you default to that if nothing else is going on. Right. You're like, oh, I can't find my wifey. 
let's chill with a girl that I may not want to be with forever, but you know, I'm single and it's fun. And then you get caught up in this weird rhythm of, uh, you know, of, of not finding the right person. And you just kind of justify it by saying, Oh, well, well, I'm single. But if you start dating a girl, that's never going to be your future. You don't leave space for the right person to come in. And it's very easy in South Florida to get caught up in this, this little cycle. And you're not even giving yourself the opportunity to spend that time being single, creating right. your empire, right? Which at the end of the day, especially if you have that mindset of just being like, right. well, I'm single. I can go out and just, you know, do some casual stuff, not be intentional about certain things. Then you're just wasting your time when you right. could be utilizing all of that time into yourself and building a better version of you. And then once the right girl comes along, it, the timing works out. Because I'm, sure exactly. you, you, I'm sure the right girl has come along and then the timing wasn't there. And then you're like, oh, well, shit, you know, what happened? You know, you, right. you want to be the best version of yourself when that does happen. 100%. Yep. 100% agreed. You're accurate. Yeah. I, I mean, I try to spew up some of this bullshit. Maybe maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. But, you know, one of these days, one of these days, it'll make sense. And then I will be invited to speak at a TED Talk event. And then I get and share my nonsense with the world. What was um what was that like? Because you said they called you right for that event. Like you got hooked up with that. So uh, I'll, I'll explain the whole the whole story like this, how I ended up getting a TED Talk. I actually called the story um, two girls in one coffee table. It's a it's a it's a play on words on uh, two girls, one cup. You remember that crap right. from back in. The yeah. So I call it two girls and one coffee table. So very, very long story short. Um, my boy hits me up and he goes, hey, can you help me move today? And look, it's my boy. So I'm going to do it. But I I'm at the point in life like no more helping fucking people with move. Hire a damn mover. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not breaking my back anymore. But I did. So I, I, I went to go get him or no, I went to his house, helped him move, grabbed the U-Haul truck. We went to his brother's house. And picked up a coffee table at his brother's house. There was a bunch of people there. They're having a barbecue, a bunch of girls. And one of the girls, they were like, hey, come back later. And I'm like, I was like, oh, she's kind of cute, whatever. So we ended up driving all the way to hell to, to BFE, drop off his coffee table. And I didn't have time to go home and change. And they were like blowing us up like, hey, come back, come back. And I'm like, yo, I look like shit. I'm, I'm dirty. They're like, who cares, man? Just fucking your family. Just come through. Anyway, I go back thinking that the girl may still be there. She wasn't. But another girl was there, and that girl was my friend's ex-girlfriend who's just a friend with everyone. She's like best friends with the people who lived in the house. Um, as we were sitting down, she goes, hey, um, I know you're doing...